Hello, fellow investors. Welcome to another episode of Ritter on Real Estate, where I teach you how to passively invest like a pro. I'm your host, Kent Ritter, and today my guest is Tim Little. Tim's the founder and CEO of Zana Investments, and he started in 2014 with a duplex and has grown that into a portfolio worth $25 million. So, Tim, really excited to have you on today and, and hear more about your story and, and how exactly you did that. Yeah, thanks, Kent. So uh, like you said, I'm a husband, father of two girls, ages three and six, and a lieutenant, car- lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves uh, and founder and CEO of Zana Investments. Zana Investments is, is named after my two daughters, Zara and Lana, so it always keeps me focused on my why. Um, in terms of my investment journey, like you said, I got got started with a duplex uh, back in 2014. At the time, I was living in, in Washington, D.C., and I really wanted to get started in real estate, but I found the market there prohibitively expensive. Um, I knew I wanted to do multifamily versus single family, more as a, a risk mitigation play. Um, you know, if you, if you have a single family home and you don't have a renter, then you have zero dollars coming in. But even if you just have a duplex and you have one renter, uh, then you still at least have some income coming in. And that could make all the difference in being pay that mortgage or not being able to pay that mortgage. So that's just a little bit about why I went directly to multifamily versus focusing on that, the single family aspect. Um, so, you know, I looked elsewhere, uh, found a, a duplex in Richmond, Virginia, which was still within driving distance. So I was able to go and, and see it, check it out, do the tours, um, and then bought that for, for 85,000 uh, with 25% down. And then, uh, Held it for a couple of years before doing a 1031 exchange into a triplex in St. Petersburg, Florida, where I was able to, you know, increase the cash flow, uh, obviously defer the taxes using the 1031 exchange and just kind of build up the number of units. But at the same time, I I was really starting to get more interested in the uh, commercial multifamily side of things. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to circle back on, on something you said, you know, you mentioned that you, the name of your company is, is the, the two names of your daughters combined, and that keeps you close to your why. And I, I love hearing that because I think that is, I mean, the why that drives us is, is everything. And I think that's, that's awesome how you've integrated that right into the company and, and you put it, you know, so forward uh, in your thinking there, because, you know, I think that's, that's the only way that you achieve success is you got to have a big why behind it. So when times get, get tough, you've got that, that motivation pushing you instead of, uh, you know, you trying to pull yourself along. So I love how you've done that. I think that's really unique. Yeah. And I know a lot of people do vision boards and stuff like that. I still haven't done mine. <laughs> I'll get around to it at, at some point. Um, but that's the one thing that's kept me on track. You know, like you said, it's something that's always visible. It's always right there in front of my face. And it's a, it's a constant reminder of, of why I'm doing this when, you know, I, I don't need to. I can just as easily have uh, a comfortable W-2 job, but, you know, that's yeah. why. I, but what's that's the fun why in I that, that, right? What's the right. fun in that? And, <laughs> you know, I bet, I would bet venture that, you know, there's been times where you don't feel like putting in another half hour, hour of work, and you look at that logo and remember why you're doing it. And you get back to it. So I think that I think that little stuff is powerful too. Absolutely. Well, cool. Well, yeah, let's dig into real estate because you know you've you've come from a duplex, you've worked your way up, kind of stair stepped it. Now you're doing larger multifamily, and uh, you know just thinking back to how you got started, you know. Where were, you, where were you at when you got started and I, I mean, career wise, and then what was it that really made you say, yeah, I got to start investing in real estate? So um, I think, you know, like a lot of people, you know, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, but I, I didn't read it at a time where I was you know, ready or willing to kind of take action on it. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you have to be in the right place when when you get inspired like that. And I wasn't really there the first time I read it. And like, I'm talking like 2005. So, you know, at, at the time, I think I went out and, and bought some, you know, program on CDs uh, after going to a, a conference and 
paid way more than I should have. Um, and then it wound up sitting in a closet because life happened, right? You know, I, I got deployed to Iraq for like 15 months, came back and then went to grad school, was a, you know, poor student again. So didn't even think that real estate was a possibility. So I didn't bother entertaining it. And it wasn't until, you know, I got my, you know, full-time a job, job and started adulting again that I was like, you know, I, I need to have a better plan for retirement, if not sooner, right? Um, and then especially after the, the birth of my, my first daughter in 2015, uh, I just didn't see my career going in, in a direction that was going to get me the financial freedom that I wanted. So I wanted to start creating at least a long-term plan. Um, you know, couldn't rely on social security. Uh, you know, I, I will have a, a military pension now, but that's that's more like fun money than re re retirement, real retirement money, right? And and just how precarious having a W two job is. A lot of people think about it in terms of being secure, but whenever you know your job is dependent on someone else then it's, it's never secure. And I, I think my wife and I realized that when, you know, she had her job of 10 years and just got laid off, um, not through any fault of her own downsizing, but it was pretty much no warning. And it just goes to show, you know, the level of unpredictability that you have when you're in a, a W-2 job. And so I didn't want that concern to be there for us. So I started to make a plan and I thought, Real estate was the best way to go about it because you can slowly build. It doesn't have to be a, a get rich quick thing. You can slowly build your portfolio. And, and I started with what I understood first, right? Sing, uh, you know, small multifamily. I, I understand that I can buy a duplex and have this much cash flow. And it wasn't until I got introduced to commercial multifamily later that I had the aha moment that I was like, okay, like I can, I can scale faster and, you know, potentially not hit those stumbling blocks of, you know, how many mortgages can I get, you know, and, and stuff like that. It just seemed like the, the best option. So that's why I started to really look at the, the commercial multifamily side of things um, and decided the most logical way to start that was to pass it as myself, right? So I had two options. I could either like, you know, pay a mentor, you know, $10,000, $20,000, or I could save up that money and then invest it and still be able to ask all the questions that I wanted to, because, you know, I was, I was giving this investor money. Um, and so that's what I decided to do. Um, I call it, you know, learn while you earn. Uh, I, I passively invested in my first deal, which was a 136 unit in San Antonio uh, back in 2017, uh, put in 25,000, which was a lot of money to me. But, you know, as you know, in the, in the syndication world, that's, that's pretty low. And that was uh, about the only deal that I was able to find someone that would take an amount that low. But I really wanted to test it out, um, to ask those questions. And I, I tell you what, when I got that first distribution check after like, I don't know, it was like the first or second quarter, that was my real proof of concept. You know, I yeah, saw it, money come in. It's all, uh, it all becomes real at that point, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and I think that's powerful. It's a huge relief too, right? Because, you know, the first time you're doing something like that and you're, you're throwing down, you know, 25K and that's, you know, most of your excess cash, you're like, man, I, I hope I, I don't end up on like the next episode of American Greed or something. And, and, right. you know, you're like, you're like yeah. okay. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's the fear for a lot of people, right? I think, I think that limiting belief is, is what prevents a lot of people from, from taking that step and moving forward. And, and I think that, you know, it, and it's, it's scary, right? Like you said, you're kind of going into the unknown. It's a new investment. It's not something that you've seen in the media a ton. Like you see the stock market all the time. So you're just more familiar with, right. Uh, even if you may not, and not speak about you in general, but may not in just in general, may not understand the ins and outs of the stock market, but at least it's kind of in your face. Right. Um, so it's going into the unknown and, and yeah, it's once you get that first distribution check, you start to say, wow, this is actually working. This person's actually sending me, sending me cash. This is fantastic. And I relate to that because I had a very similar experience in, I started the same way you did. I started out by passively investing. I love what you said about, uh, 
learning and earning. I think that that's a, a great line because I mean, that was kind of how I viewed it too, as if I can put my money to work, but also have access to these syndicators that know what they're doing. I think that's a great way to learn. Um, so yeah, I mean, just really resonant. Your story really resonates uh, in, in how I went about it myself. So I think that's, uh, you know, it's obviously a path that can work. It can work to get you to the next level. So you said a lot there. I wanted to unpack a couple of things. I was taking some notes sure. as, as you were talking. So, you know, you mentioned reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad at a time before you were really ready to take action, you know, and I think that that was, I think that's interesting. I think that, you know, clearly your mind, your mindset wasn't there yet. And like we talk, I talk about mindset a lot. Mindset is so important. You got to believe that you can take the action, but I, I bet that it was also because your big why wasn't there yet. You know, you, you didn't have that big why, that family to take care of, those girls to, to take care of and, and give a great life to, right? And so it wasn't until that big why came along to really push you forward that you went out and took that action. So I just wanted to tie, tie those together because I think it's important for people to understand We've talked about why a lot already, but how important that why is. And you got to identify, you know, like you can't just be in it for the money because that will come and go. And, and like when things get hard, wanting to make a little more money isn't going to isn't going to propel you forward. You got to have something deeper. And so, again, I just love your why. And, and I bet that's what really got you started when, when you know, it's kind of the you've the education had started, but once that mission kind of came together, then you really took off. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Cause you know, the first time, like I said, 2005, uh, I, I think it was that I read it. I was in my twenties. Right. And, and what was my priority at that time? It was, it was the money, um, right. you know, and it's probably lucky that I didn't because, you know, that was the build up to the, you know, the housing collapse and everything else. And I probably would have been that guy, you know, holding, you know, three single family homes, that are, you know, completely underwater. So <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just, you know, thank, thank my lucky stars that I, I probably didn't do that uh, back then and take massive action because it, it probably would have been a bad move, but I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, cool. So you shared before we were talking that um, your, fir your first deal is about to go full cycle here, here soon. And so I wanted to, to dig in full cycle. I mean, by selling it and being able to, to actually realize those gains. And so I wanted to, to dig into that a, a little more as far as, um, you know, just tell, tell me a little bit about that deal and kind of how you kind of how you got started in that deal. It's kind of your first big multifamily. And then, you know, just give us some of the details. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I, I like to tell people that I snuck into that deal um, because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a deal that I put together. It was one that I came into um, a little late in the process, but it basically was, you know, I went to um, a multifamily conference uh, here in the Tampa area and, you know, met a lot of great folks who were motivated and who came out of that conference, you know, just wanting to take something down. You know, they were, they were super motivated as was I. Um, and I had saved up a, a little cap, uh, capital because, the year before that, I was on a, a 12, nine month deployment. So I was able to, to save up a little money and, you know, kept in contact with these folks. Uh, and they were like, hey, hey, Tim, I know, I know you got a little capital saved up. You want to invest on this deal that we have in Tampa? And I was like, well, not really. I, you know, I want to do my own deal. I'm, I'm hyped. You know, I want to take down my own deal and I want to have, you know, capital to put in so that I got skin in the game. Um, you know, that whole thing. And they're like, okay, okay. Um, and then, you know, meanwhile, I, I continue looking for stuff, not making much headway myself. Um, and then like, I'd say like three months later, you know, they, they contact me again. They're like, Hey, Hey Tim, you still got that money? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, yeah, what's up? They're like, we really need to, to get this deal in, in Tampa closed. So if you're willing to bring in your capital, um, you know, do some legwork as, uh, as the boots on the ground in, in Tampa, then we're willing to bring you in as a GP. And I was like, okay, right? So um, it was a matter of, I got a very small slice uh, of the GP, but what they were able to do is um, count my money as, as LP money as well. So, you know, double dipped in a sense there, um, but 
the reason I like this deal is, is one, I saw that we were getting it for a, a very good price. Um, you know, as you know, that the Tampa market is kind of on fire right now, but even in 2019, it was, it was pretty hot. Uh, but we were able to find this portfolio of apartments, some as large as like 20, 23 units and all the way down to like duplexes. Um, but it was 59 units in total. And they were able to get it under contract for 67,000 a door, which was really cheap at the time. You know, most stuff even back then was going probably like 85, 90 mm-hmm. a door, uh, more of a working class neighborhood, but there was still a lot of opportunity to improve it, to make it nicer, to raise rents, to, to get uh, more stable tenants in there, et cetera. So I saw the, the value add play. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to get in on it. But more than anything, you know, when you're starting out in, in multifamily, you want to get a GP deal under your belt because it's it's huge when it comes to credibility. Um, you know, whether it's with investors, brokers, lenders, um, a lot of them just aren't going to look at you unless you've done at, at least one deal as a general partner. So this was an opportunity for a win-win for all of us. Um, I would, like I said, I was able to get in help them out with a lot of stuff here on the ground in Tampa. And then we maintain those relationships uh, ever since then. Uh, some of those folks I've, I've gone on to partner with on other deals as well and passively invest in their deals. Um, and we bought that, like I said, 20, 2019, uh, about 67,000 a door. And we're gonna be selling it now in, in two portfolios just because of the distance between some of the properties I don't know, the, the lender wanted to divide those, but um, we're going to be selling them for 113 and 115 a door between the, the two portfolios. So definitely did okay uh, on this, this deal here in Tampa. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, sounds like you're going to have a home run. So congratulations there. And then, nice. yeah, I think it's great that you were it's great that you were able to get started, you know, in that way. I mean, I think that that's how a lot of people get started. I mean, it, it, it's similar in a way to how I got started. Um, meaning that, you know, one of the best ways to get started is by partnering with others that have more experience, you know, same Absolutely. thing when I, on my first GP deal is partnering with others that had more experience. I was able to come in, provide value to the deal. Um, you know, but I, I kind of tell people, like you said, you snuck in a deal. I said, well, I, I felt like I was sitting shotgun in the deal. You know, I wasn't quite in the driver's seat, but I was at least in up front. And so it was a great way to learn. And then from there, I mean, that that's exactly similar to you. What propelled my career to start doing my own deals and being in the driver's seat and, um, you know, kind of the rest is history. So I think it's a, just another example of a great way to get started. You know, you don't have to take all the risk yourself. You don't have to go out on your own. One of the best ways is to partner and to partner with people that are more experienced than you and, and have, uh, you know, have learned from some mistakes so that you can, you can avoid those. And uh, yeah, so I think that's great. And kind of with that in mind, one thing I wanted to ask you after, cause you've gone on to do other deals now and you've got a pretty sizable portfolio about 25 million. So what, what have you, what do you know now that you wish you had known back when you were getting into that first deal? What can you share with our listeners to, you know, to give them a couple tips. I guess, um, you know, something as simple as even like the, the, the property inspection, right? Um, you, you always want to believe that people are going to do their job and, and do it right. Um, but <laughs> you, can never, you can never do it on, on faith alone. Um, so what does that mean? That means walking every single unit at an apartment building, not just you know, a third of them to get a good idea, because I I guarantee you there'll be that one apartment that you don't check that's like a complete gut job, you know, or it's just filled with black mold, whatever the case may be. It it inevitably is going that way. If you, if there's one you didn't check, that'll be the one unit that's going to cost you an extra 10 or $20,000 that you didn't take into account in your, in your underwriting. And that thing for us, um, was the roofs. So obviously, you know, potentially one of the most expensive uh, capital expenditures on, on a multifamily, just one of the roofs, they had 
done a lot of like patching. And so they were basically just putting shingles on top of shingles on top of shingles. And like, it was not to code and it just had to be ripped off, you know, new plywood. And so it, it wound up being <clears throat> like a considerable enough extra cost that we weren't anticipating that it, it hurt, right? It, not, nothing that's going to ruin the deal or anything like that, but it still hurts when you, when you find something like that, um, that that you weren't anticipating. So that's the big thing I would say, you know, trust but verify, as we say in the military, you know, don't, don't yeah. assume that everyone's going to do the job to the standard that you expect. Yeah, I love that. Trust but verify. I think that's critical. I think it's important for people to understand, like, the time to walk all the units is, is <clears throat> during your due diligence when you have it under contract. If you're, you know, nobody's going to let you do that ahead of getting it un under contract. You're going to be able to see a couple of units. And, and so you have to take a leap of faith, but that's why you have a solid due diligence period. And that's why in that due diligence, like you said, you know, hundred percent walk every unit. Cause yeah, you could have, I've seen examples where there's an empty apartment and the maintenance guys have stripped everything out of that apartment to replace, you know, parts in, in many other apartments. And so you just, you see, you see this kind of stuff and you learn why it's important to trust, but verify and, and even just not trust a little bit and, and very much verify. <laughs> and, and my yeah. other, like the other thing I, I, I'd say just around with the roofs and things like make sure when you're walking the units, you're bringing somebody with you that, that knows what they're looking for. You know, it's what, like, you got to put good people around you. So make sure you have somebody that actually knows what a good and bad roof look like walking the roofs, make sure yeah. you have somebody that knows, you know, what, what a quality HVAC system should look like. Right. So like when I go out and walk properties, I bring my property management company with me, have mm -hmm. maintenance guy come with me because, you know, when I, when I look at a hot water heater, I see a hot water heater. I, it doesn't <laughs> tell me a whole lot about age and, and what shape it's in and all those things. So it's just important to, to surround yourself with people that, that know more than you. And so those are just a couple of tips I want people to pick up, but Tim, thank you for, for sharing that story. I think that's inspiring. And as we wrap things up here, I want to take you through our keys to success round. I've got four questions I want to ask you. The first one is if you were, what you do passively investing with somebody else, and you can only ask that person one question before you got to send your money, what would that one question be? Yeah, and I, I knew this was coming, but it's it's still such a, a hard question because <laughs> I, I tell people to ask lots of lots of questions. But I think something that's often overlooked is I would say, who are your boots on ground, and how often will they visit the property? Because it, you know it's hard for me to believe, but there there are sponsors who buy properties and then one hundred percent delegate it. I guess is the best word to the third. Uh, third-party property management company. And, you know, absolutely, you need to rely on them for, for 90% of, of what's happening on the day-to-day. -day. But at the same time, that sponsor, the syndicator, should be going to the property, you know, during the due diligence period. And then in some, uh, you know, frequency thereafter, uh, you, just to check on it. Right. Like it, it doesn't need to be all the time, um, but I, that I don't want uh, someone to uh, try to get me to invest in a deal that they will never see themselves. What do you think the right answer to that question is? So I, I guess for me, I would say I would like them to visit maybe quarterly. Because that that's a long enough time that you can see if, if things are going awry, but it's not too frequent that, you know, it's taking up all your time. Because obviously the more deals you have, you know, the more properties that you would, you know, have to visit. But I, I think that's also the benefit of like the, the, the other sponsors that I work with. You know, I try to work with folks that are not just right here, but are in different areas. So like the team that I'm, I work with now, we have uh, one person in Atlanta. Uh, one person in, in, in Dallas. And then, you know, there's like three of us that are here in Florida, in different parts of Florida. So, so that way it gives us the ability to say, hey, yeah, we, we can do uh, a deal in Augusta, Georgia, because we have a guy who lives 40 minutes away, you know, 
And same thing with Orlando. I can hit up Orlando pretty easy. Tallahassee, the most recent deal that we did, the 136 unit, I, I've already gone up there twice and we just closed on like the 30th of December. So, you know, it, it just tells you that, um, you know, I think the, the sponsor ha has your best interest at heart because they're, they're actually going and seeing the property because so much can go wrong um, if, if they never get out there. And they won't know because the property management company is going to give them metrics, um, maybe even some pictures, but they're still controlling the narrative, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. um, it goes back to the whole trust, but verify thing. Trust, but verify. I love it. So what are you most proud of in your career? Um, really, it's, it's just the, the fact that I'm, that I'm even doing this. I mean, like I, I know so many people who have educated themselves, you know, on investing in real estate, whether it's single family, multifamily, it doesn't matter, but then they, they never actually do anything about it. And, and I think that's the difference between uh, someone who's interested in real estate and someone who is a real estate investor. You know, the, the real estate investor actually does it. And for me, it's the fact that I'm not only doing this, but exposing my daughters to the business. You know, I've had them with me at, at units helping clean up. And I tell them that I buy and sell apartment buildings. And it may not sink in now, you know, they're only three and six years old. But I think what it's going to do in the long term is just expand their mindset in terms of what they think is possible. Because, I, you know, I could tell you growing up, not even a remote possibility in my mind. I didn't, I thought only rich people did that stuff because that's, that's what I knew, right? Like my, my dad was a, a TV repairman, you know, when I was a kid. So he, he wasn't investing in pretty much anything. And he certainly wasn't buying apartment buildings. So giving them the opportunity to even be exposed to it and to have them have their, their mindset kind of broadened by that, I think is what I'm really most proud of. I think that's awesome. I think you're going to, I mean, they're going to be set up for such an advantage, like you said, of believing what's possible and, and, and seeing that what investing can do. So yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be set up well with a great mindset. That's awesome. What book should everybody read? Yeah. So I would say either uh, Atomic Habits or Who Not How. I figured you were going to ask me one. So I'm kind of cheating by, by saying two, but um, neither are real estate necessarily, but one can have a big impact on productivity, atomic habits. And the other really helps you to kind of reframe the best way to get your goals in who, not how, you know, not focusing on the how to do it, but who do you need to be associated to in order to get it done? Yeah, those are, I've read both of them. They're both fantastic books. I would highly recommend everybody read those. Uh, Atomic Habits uh, was a good one for me, but Who Not How really, really made me think differently about, mm. you know, what is my highest and best use and what should I be focusing my time on and how do I then put others, put a team in place to take care of everything else, right? And, and that has been a game changer. So yeah, definitely recommend both of those. Last but not least, what is your number one key to success? So for this, I, I think I would have to say relationships, right? Multifamily is such a relationship driven business. And, you know, it, it's hard to start and probably impossible to be successful in multifamily without developing relationships along the way. And, and I talked about some of those relationships, whether it's, you know, brokers, lenders, uh, strategic partners. Um, I couldn't have gotten any of the deals done that I have had I not, you know, developed good relationships and maintained those good relationships and tried to, like you said, provide value to others. Even if you're not getting paid for it that time, even if you're, you're just giving it away, um, because you really never know when people are going to call back and be like, Hey, uh, I, Tim, you know, this, right. Uh, how, can you help me with that? Because it, it all comes back around. It, it sounds cliched, but, but really the more you put out there, the more people are going to want to help you. So relationships. Yeah. Fantastic answer. 
And Tim, thanks for coming on and providing so much value and inspiring story. If folks want to learn more about you and what you're working on, how can they get a hold of you? Sure. The uh, easiest way to get a hold of me is by email, I guess, at tim at zanainvestments.com. But I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. So definitely look me up there. I'm always trying to provide value by reading and analyzing all those real estate articles that everybody else doesn't have time to read. Um, and I would also like to give your listeners a free gift if they go to zanainvestments.com backslash cheat sheet. Uh, they can get the passive investors cheat sheet, which will explain in plain language all, all the terms that they need to know to confidently start passively investing in multifamily real estate. Great. Well, Tim, thanks again for coming on. We'll make sure all that is linked below so you guys can go click on those links and get a hold of Tim, get access to his cheat sheet. And with that, I hope you have a great rest of the day. All right. Thank you, Kent.